Hey, it's Justin Goff. I'm here with Connor Boylan, Copy Accelerator member, uh, who's had a really big year so far, launching his new offer uh, in the men's dating niche. And uh, I wanted to bring him on because I think Connor's a really good example of someone who went from copywriter to offer owner uh, in a very short period of time uh, and has been able to scale his offer to nowadays is doing somewhere around 100 sales a day on cold uh, YouTube traffic, which is pretty amazing. I mean, the amount of people out there who have actually put out an offer and especially their first offer and get it to work, uh, <laughs> it's pretty small. So uh, he's had a pretty good good uh, accomplishment there. So I wanted to bring him on to talk about that. So let's, let's start with where you were at before this. So you were writing copy. Were you, were you fully like freelancing? Were you writing for one specific client? Where were you at before launching this offer? Yeah. So <clears throat> the way I learned copywriting was to, um, I used to be a coach in the men's dating space. I worked for a company called Dow Badass. They're, they're pretty well known in marketing circles. And um, <clears throat> I decided, you know, I wanted to stop coaching and learn how to do copywriting. And so I had a, a big network in the dating space and I started, I got a few people to hire me to run their email list. So I started writing email copy. I went from one client to about three and I was managing their email lists full time. And, you know, it's making like decent money for considering that I'm just an entrepreneur working for myself, had the freedom to write emails whenever I wanted. And, you know, like I didn't need to do much. And I had consistent clients that were paying me, uh, you know, between 15 and 20% of whatever I brought in for their email list. So it was a good gig. So I, I never really freelanced with like a bunch of different clients all the time. I like to have just one or two that paid me consistently. It was just a lot easier and more consistent for me. And um, I decided I wanted to transition. And one day, actually, one of my clients that I ran their list for, they had their assistant call me and I thought it was going to be, um, you know, a phone call to introduce herself and talk about working together. And it's actually a call to fire me. Um, and so it kind of caught me way off guard. And, you know, they, she started off by being like, hey, you know, I've heard such great things about you. It's so nice to be talking to you. And I started to get this feeling of like, what is this about? Like, why are you buttering me up? And it turned out they didn't need my services anymore. Um, I don't think I did anything wrong. They just didn't need me. And so they let me go. And I remember being so frustrated um, because the owner of the company never said anything to me. He just had his assistant call me and fire me. And at the time I felt very disrespected by that. Uh, I don't know if that was his intention or not. I never found out, but it was frustrating as hell. And it really pissed me off. And I think usually, um, I know a lot of people are listening to this wondering like, how do you make a transition? Usually it comes after you've had enough frustration and you're tired of dealing with the same thing over and over again, and you're ready to take a risk. So for me, um, that was kind of the final straw. I wasn't making great money running other people's lists. I just liked the freedom, uh, but I was probably only making like 60,000 a year before taxes. It's just, that's nothing to get excited about. It's just survival money really. And so I thought, you know, I'm good enough to run these people's lists and I know this market really well. I've been a coach. I've met all these customers. I've worked for different companies. There's no reason why I can't do this for myself. So started my own list. Um, I had a good network of affiliates. A lot of people in the men's dating space, they're just affiliates and they always need new offers to mail for. And if you create a new offer, they'll mail for it. And I, I kind of leveraged my relationships. I think the first two offers I created were pretty mediocre. They were not very good. This is before I joined the mastermind and uh, people mailed for it just because they knew me and we were friends and they wanted to help me out, you know? So I started, got my own list going and uh, it's really hard to, to break through if you don't have a really good offer for affiliates. They just, they only mail a few times and then they'll stop because it's not really crushing it for them. And I knew that, um, I think I heard you guys on a webinar at some point last summer talking about how to get things running on cold traffic. And um, it kind of broke a belief that I had that cold traffic's really difficult to do. And a lot of people in men's dating told me it's really hard to do cold traffic uh, unless you're running on adult traffic, which I didn't want to do. I didn't want to go that route. And uh, hearing you guys talk about it kind of broke that belief and made me realize it's possible. I can totally do cold traffic if I want to take the risk to buy the traffic and make it work. And so I started shifting my, my, shifting my goals to how do I get away from affiliate mailings and just create my own thing? So I joined your guys mastermind and uh, I know you said it was the first offer I put out. 
the first one I put out with your method from your mastermind. Gotcha. Um, I written VSLs before that. They just weren't that good. Um, so you guys helped me to really level up, but, uh, yeah, I made the transition in about four or five months and it's mostly driven by frustration of being a freelancer and just not having ownership and control, which I think a lot of people can relate to. Yeah. I, I always, out of all the copywriters I know, I feel like there's always very two distinct kind of copywriters. There's one who's usually purely a copywriter and he's very content and happy writing copy and has no problem just working for clients for 20, 30, 40 years. Um, and there's a lot of people that like, it, it doesn't even, maybe the thought of starting a business comes to them. Um, but it, it's really not their main prerogative. And then there's other ones like you and me and Stefan where we were always copywriters, but the big goal was always just to have our own company. Um, yeah. and, and I feel like there's, there, there really is two very different kind of copywriters out there. Um, and, and you could see it in a lot of them too. Like, when I watch companies hire copywriters who I can tell are entrepreneurs, I'm like, you know, I mean, you're going to lose him in a year or two. Like you realize that. And they're like, sometimes they don't see it. Um, yeah. But yeah, you're very that's much. How, the type. That's how I feel about the guys working <laughs> for me now. Like they'll probably stick around for a year. And if they're like me, they're going to want to move on. Right. Um, cool. So let's, uh, let's transition into when you started putting this new offer together, uh, you wanted to create something that worked on cold traffic. What, what, what was it about your two previous offers that you kind of learned from them that, uh, that made them not really work on, on traffic? You know, the first two I did, I was trying too hard to be different. Like I'd already seen a lot of winning offers in the dating space. And I thought I had some idea that if you wanted to have a breakout hit, you needed to be very different. And I went too far away from what works and um, trying to do my own thing, trying to be too creative. And, you know, I think some of the angles or the promises were a little gimmicky. It was just straight too far away from what's proven to work. And for this next one, I stuck very closely to what I know works. And really the only thing different about this new offer was the story and the angle in the beginning. But everything else I already knew was gonna work because I'd seen it work a million times. And, you know, when you run someone's email list, you get a sense for every offer out there that's working because you have to watch their VSL and figure out how to promote it as an affiliate. So I already had all these patterns in my head of what this, what does the men's dating market respond to? And I also knew them very well from when I was a coach. My job used to be taking these guys to bars and helping them meet girls. So I've like spent nights getting drunk and listening to all their problems. And so I'm intimately familiar with like the pain and desire in this market. And so I decided for this one, I'm trying to hit a home run. Let me stick really closely to what I know works and not deviate too much. And, you know, I think I resisted doing that before because I didn't want to be a copycat. You know, I didn't want to be, um, they call it having a me too offer. Like you're just copying somebody else. I didn't want to do that, but um, I went too far the other direction and tried to be too different. And so the, the difference in this one was I'm like exactly what's working. And then I tweaked it by maybe like 15% to make it my own. That's, that's super smart and a really, really good point because I mean, one of the best ways to create an offer is find the five or six offers that are working in that niche that are just crushing it, break it down and find all the commonalities between them. Like if you see that four of them have a super emotional story as the opening, okay, then I need to have an emotional story as the opening. Uh, or if four or five of them have, I don't know, a really unique mechanism that you haven't heard before. Okay. I need to come up with a really good mechanism for, I mean, that's, all the best offers really break down to like, I don't know, three to five things that like really, really matter. Um, mm -hmm. And if you get those three to five things right, you tend, you tend to get the offer right and it tends to convert. You know, I wanted to ask you, what do you think about like being innovative and trying new things? Because I don't want to just write the same thing over and over forever. I do want to come up with like a new idea that people haven't seen or like a breakout hit. Like how does that happen? knowing that there's still proven things that always work that you kind of have to stick to. I think if you have an inkling that something innovative uh, could work based on just your experience from, let's say you're running, like you said, running an email list or you're talking to your customers and you see maybe somebody's not hitting on something, but something that just keeps coming up over and over and over again. I'm always in favor of that type of stuff. I think a lot of good ideas can come out of that. Um, I mean, I think the, the core tenet in a lot of men's dating stuff specifically is probably not going to change. Like, 
you know, you know this, like I, I've given feedback to a couple of the guys who are in our group who do dating stuff. And like Scott, one of the guys was trying to do, do some type of mindset product. And I'm like, that, that, that'll work for the back end and it'll be okay as a back end offer. But your average guy who gets rejected at the bar and just wants the secret sauce, that, that's just way too deep for him. Like, yeah. he, and, you, and you know this too, because you, you've, te- you've actually taught these guys this the stuff they really want isn't really like even almost applicable. I mean, it's, it's almost not even reality. It's like, they want like one or two lines that somehow they're going to pull the hottest girl in the bar. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, the core desire is always going to be sex. And yeah. there's some offers built around love and int- intimacy as well. Um, like getting a girlfriend, but the core desire is sex. And the thing they ask about more than anything else that they cannot get enough of is what do I say? So every great offer is built around that. Either lines to say, words, questions, something that you say that gets you what you want. And anytime I've deviated from that, it converted less. I've tried to sell mindset stuff. It, it doesn't work on the front end very well. Um, on the back end, once they trust you, you can sell that kind of thing. There's a, lot, there's a lot of guys that want that. And those are the guys that will eventually buy like high ticket coaching packages. But yeah. the average guy paying like $47 for the product just wants to get laid and he wants to know what to say. Right. Yeah. I mean, the core tenets of pretty much every industry, like don't change a lot. I mean, like, like you said, it's the guy who wants to get laid. He wants to be able to pick up girls. And then there's, there's a bunch of other stuff, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Like he doesn't want to look like an idiot in front of his friends. Um, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of weird stuff actually with men in comparison to other men that actually affects guys mm-hmm. more than even just how they relate to women uh, when, it comes, when it comes to dating and stuff. But like you said, you, you can just kind of keep pumping out those offers based on those core tenants that you know that work. Um, and like you said, w- one of the best things to do is you continuously promoting those offers and seeing, okay, this is working, this is working. I mean, you and I could exchange all the ideas we want about what works, but sales and data are the number one thing that actually matter uh, by time. far. I mean, it's kind of like to use the dating analogy that a woman tells you she wants a guy who does this, this, and this, but it's like, then she goes home with this guy. And it's like, that's, <laughs> that's all the data you need. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a common frustration they have is just, they're so confused about what women actually want. Let, let's talk about that a little bit. Cause it is a very interesting market because um, I mean, the dating market exploded back in the mid two thousands with uh, the game and all the pickups, pickup artist stuff. It was a huge, huge, I mean, all these companies were really built off of that. And they were literally just having people throw money at them. Uh, I mean, honestly, most of them weren't, had no idea what the hell they were doing in terms of marketing. They were just getting money thrown at them hand over fist. And my, my kind of gut set, I mean, it's really changed a lot in the last few years. I mean, there used to be five to 10 different offers working on cold traffic in that niche. Now it's a lot of the big players are gone. They moved on to personal development and they moved on to health and moved on to something else. Um, I'm kind of curious how you see the dating market now and how it's, how the men in it have changed because there's been so much changes in terms of society and masculinity and the me too movement yeah. and Tinder. I mean, it's been a pretty monumental change in the last five years. Yeah. <clears throat> so the whole pickup bars trend has kind of, the wave has died down. It, there's still a niche for it, but it's back to being a small niche, not like a huge wave. And, um, a lot of people that got in the market got rich during that and then it fizzled out and they didn't know what to do next. So yeah, like you said, they moved on to a lot of people moved into health supplements, um, like a lot of sex offers, like sexual performance supplements or um, just any other kind of health supplement. A lot of them moved into biz op, like how to make money. But uh, there's still a couple that work on cold traffic. A lot of them also just shifted to adult traffic. Yep. Uh, where you can be as X-rated as you want, <laughs> and they run on like Traffic Junkie and a lot of other porn porn traffic sites. Uh, I just didn't want to do that. I didn't really feel good about it. But um, the cool thing to know is, no matter how much this changes, it's a, we're selling a core desire that human beings will always have. It's evergreen. Guys are always going to want sex and love and to feel important and to feel desired. And so one thing I'm seeing. Uh, When I built my email list, it was primarily off affiliates that already had big lists and then they mailed to me. And most of the guys that ended up on my list were like 45 to 55. They were a lot older. And now that I'm on YouTube driving cold traffic, the demographic is way younger. It's a whole new generation. 
And so a lot of the offers that are basically geared towards like the dirty old man kind of avatar. I don't know if you're familiar with the offers in this niche, but like Pandora's box and stealth attraction and oh. they're very dirty. And it's usually older men that are just like, they just want, they, well, they're not even going to talk and horny. use it. Yeah, exactly. And they're not even going to use this stuff. They're just really curious they're, you know, there's a big entertainment factor to why they buy this. Um, a lot of the guys now are like 22 and frustrated and they don't know how to use Tinder. They grew up where Tinder is the main way to meet women. And they're terrified of being uh, accused of being a toxic man or you know, being creepy. That's a huge fear for a lot of these guys is being seen as a creep or a pervert or somebody who's harassing women. The Me Too movement really put that a lot of fear in the guys that wasn't there before. Um, where like, you know, they're, they're, they, they see themselves as very nice guys. That, that's like their big problem they feel they have is I'm too nice. I'm, I'm too boring. I'm too agreeable. And it would suck if I said the wrong thing. And then I got labeled as, you know, Harvey Weinstein or some awful guy like that. I really don't want that to happen to me. Um, so I actually wrote, I have a new VSL that I just launched where we're talking about that a lot, but um, the desire is still there. Yep. And, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the people in, in the men's dating space that I know that moved away, kind of discouraged me from trying to do cold traffic because they saw the market change and it wasn't as easy as, you know, what was working for them before. Um, so I'm actually gl really glad I joined this mastermind and gave it a shot because it definitely works. The messaging has changed a little bit, but there's still guys out there that will always need a solution to this problem. Yeah. I mean, it, it, like you said, it's a core desire of men. Like it's not going to go away the same way the women's relationship market, which is more kind of more about, finding the right man kind of stuff uh, mm -hmm. and or increasing like the bond with the man you already have. Uh, it's a little different angle than the men's, which is more about meeting, meeting and talking to girls. Um, but that, that stuff's never going to go away. I mean, it's the same desire as like making money or losing weight. Like that shit's been around since 1700. Like it's, <laughs> there's been offers like in newspapers for that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, it, it's always going to be there. Um, Let's go to kind of next steps. So you, you came up with the offer or you started thinking, you said you wanted to create this offer that, that works on cold traffic. Where did you actually start in terms of putting together the offer and like coming up with, okay, here's, here's going to be my hook on it. Here's how I'm going to actually make this unique and different than the other offers out there. So I really dove into the research part for this one. Um, I've already seen most of the offers that work in this market. So I have notes on them, you know, like, I could quote for you the, the top 10 offers and what their mechanism is and what their story is. So I've, I've got a pretty clear idea of what works. And so that combined with doing a lot of research and looking at you, a lot of YouTube comments, cause I knew I wanted to advertise there. So I watched YouTube videos and read what the comments said. I went on Reddit and read people's frustrations and forums. And like, I was trying to use the same structure that I know would work, but I was looking for a unique story or a unique angle that hadn't been done before. And I found a couple of stories. I've done three different versions of this VSL now, so it's, it's evolved, it's changed. But um, yeah, I was looking for a new story or a new angle that I could put into the same skeleton that, that's always worked. Um, so that was a big change for me because I know that's part of the process for RMBC research. And uh, I never wanted to do that before. It's just kind of tedious. It's not that fun. But I spent a good week just digging into research. I had a I already had a list of customers so I could research, um, survey them and ask them questions. And um, I even got a few of them on the phone that I knew from the past and just interviewed them and asked for stories. Really, I was looking for stories. Okay, so let's go to, um, I, I guess in terms of like the mechanism, did your mechanism that you came up with, did that come out of the research or did that come with just kind of like brainstorming? How did that actually for formulate? You know, I have a file in my computer that's just called scraps. And when I write copy and ideas come out that don't really fit, I just put them in the scraps file and then maybe they'll be useful later. And so I dug through that and I had a bunch of ideas for mechanisms. And so I, I wrote up like four or five descriptions as like a product description. Um, this is something you said to do at the mastermind and at the live event, like survey your list and ask, would you buy this? Yes or no. So I took like my five best ideas and I surveyed my list and gave them a description of the same product, but each one, the mechanism was different and the price was all the same. And I just went with the one that they voted for. Smart, smart. 
Awesome, man. So you got, you got the mechanism you had, you found a story, correct? From a mm-hmm. bunch of your research. Um, when you started putting, you started to put the VSL together, your first one you put out, was it just plain Jane, just PowerPoint, nothing really to it? Oh, it still is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it works great. It, it's working really well. My YouTube ads are PowerPoints too. I tested a few different versions. I tested my face talking. I tested slides with my voice. I tested, I hired girls online to read a script for me. Um, I had their voice, a female voiceover. And so far my voice over slides has outconverted everything. So I just keep going with it. Wow. That's yeah. interesting. So save me a lot of money on producing a video. Yeah. It is funny how sometimes just the most basic ugly shit just, <laughs> just does yeah. so well. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you got, you got the offer together. You got the copy written. You got the VSL. What were your first steps in terms of getting it tested? I know, I know you talked a little bit with Scott Jackson in our Copy Accelerator Mastermind. He's been doing really well on cold YouTube traffic. Uh, yeah. Was that kind of one of the first steps that got that going? <clears throat> yeah. So I started running some ads and then got connected with Scott. And um, he was awesome, man. He's, he's been running YouTube ads for a while. He's had a lot of success. So he hopped on the phone with me for like an hour and just showed me what to do. And um, like a, he just showed me a few tricks and a few new like targeting strategies I wasn't aware of. And uh, th- pretty much the next day, the offer started scaling up. I just needed wow. to get a lot of clicks to the VSL and I didn't know like different targeting strategies. So there's a lot of broad keywords and broad audiences on YouTube and the targeting is really simple. Like the first keyword I tried was just dating advice and that keyword alone started blowing up for me. So I started doing more keywords, more um, affinity audiences, there's something called in-market audience, like people that are ready to buy things. And they're huge, huge audiences. And um, I guess I, I tested 10 different ad creatives and wound up with three or four that were winners and just started testing different combinations of that on YouTube and watching it scale up. So right out of the gate, the, what was the main, the main things you were testing were the ads? Yeah, the VSL didn't change much for the first month. Um, so I was mostly testing ad creatives. And um, <clears throat> one thing I've tested since then is putting the actual VSL as the ad. That works really well. Um, so you skip a few clicks. And uh, people will actually sit on YouTube and watch a 50, or mine's like 45 <laughs> minutes. They'll just watch an ad for 45 minutes. If it's the same VSL that they were going to watch on the landing page, I just put it right on YouTube. Uh, and they just click to the order form. So that's working really well. Um, but once I got a few creatives that were working, I noticed... Um, there's one or two angles that were working better than everything else. So I actually went and wrote a new lead and a new story from my VSL based on the ads that were working best. And that's, that got a nice boost in conversions as well. Super, super smart. I, I want to highlight that point because it's, it's one that works over and over and over again in pretty much every niche out there. Um, if you have ad creatives that are working uh, a specific angle, definitely you should be trying to lead with that same angle because over and over again, we see this when, when an ad creative that has a spe- specific angle works as soon as you try to lead with that same angle it, it tends to work again uh mostly because that angle obviously is connecting and and really just hitting home with people so uh you should definitely yeah. try it as a lead as well yeah and i usually I, I feel like every niche has their own things that they respond to uh and in men's dating curiosity about what to say just usually wins as an angle so i tried like one innocent question, a five word question you should never ask a woman. That one's the winner right now. There's all these different like angles on, there's some phrase or word or question that you can say to get the result you want or that you shouldn't say if you don't wanna get the pain. And I've tried a bunch of variations of that and they just always seem to work. I'm just teasing them about something they don't know that they really need to find out and really teasing them from the ad all the way through till they buy the product. Right. I mean, the, the curiosity, that's kind of one of the tenet, the core tenets of like what we teach in the Copy Accelerator Mastermind with ads. Uh, curiosity is one of the four uh, we always talk about. And you're doing, a pr- you're doing a really, really curious version of that, which is like pretty super blind. Uh, you're probably not yeah. giving away anything. Um, nope. Yep. Awesome, man. I get some complaints about that too, but this, <laughs> the conversion rate is worth it. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it's smart too because you know, like we've all seen the ads for our, 
the three questions to ask a girl that have been going mm -hmm. running since like 2008. Yeah, that's Pandora's box. They, it's still working for the past 10 years. It just always works. Yep, super smart. Okay, so you, you got it working uh, right out of the gate. It kind of worked on YouTube. What were kind of the next steps from there in terms of scaling it up? Well, first I started to, <clears throat> the priority number one was to just keep sales rolling in every day. And I found, I'm still not very good at scaling things. So, you know, a campaign will work for a few days or a week and then start fizzling out and you got to try a new one. Uh, they don't just last forever. And also the more money you spend per campaign, the cost per acquisition starts rising and eating into your profit margin. So it's a juggling act. I'm still learning how that works. So I've been doing that for a few months, just learning and talking to people that are better than me and seeing what I can learn. But as long as the sales keep rolling in every day, um, and they're obviously going on my list, going through my autoresponder and, um, you know, all, all the backend stuff that I have set up. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about that. So what, what's your, um, what's your backend actually look like? So once they buy, when they, when they go to my VSL, there's an opt-in. It just says like, what's your biggest frustration? And there's a survey they fill out and then they just put their email in and they get on my list. And when the traffic is good, I'll get like a thousand leads a day just from that, just people voluntarily opting in. Wow. And if they haven't bought the product yet, I put them through a pretty aggressive affiliate autoresponder. So I sell the crap out of my products. If they haven't bought those, they go on an autoresponder with my best emails for the best affiliate offers that I know that pay out the most. So they're, there are offers in this niche that pay like a hundred, hundred twenty dollars per sale. Um, so I just line up the greatest hits in front of them, and once they buy my product, I start putting more content in front of them. So one of my goals is to build out my YouTube channel with more organic content. So I want all my buyers to see all my best YouTube videos and start bonding with them and building trust more, and also um, bringing them back to the product they bought and reminding them of certain parts that they may have missed or you know chapters that they should read again. You know, when you sell info products, most customers don't actually read the product that they bought. Uh, it's crazy when you realize, like, I want them to change their life. I want them to get a result. But most people don't have the uh, follow through to actually read it. And so I'm, I'm trying to get them to consume what they bought. Um, one thing I'm adding to for customers is if they haven't bought the first upsell, uh, a sequence that repitches them on that upsell to try and add more value to their order in the first four or five days. Okay. Yeah. Nice. But mostly it's just reselling the product if they haven't bought it and then selling the shit out of very aggressively of every affiliate product that I have in, in a lineup. So I'm kind of more focused on cash flow really quickly than um, long term relationship building right now. Yep. Do you, are, are you promoting any higher ticket stuff to your list? Yeah. So, I don't really do coaching anymore, but I know a lot of other guys in the niche that do coaching and they have a nice setup with a webinar or um, a qualifying sequence to get a, a, a prospect on the phone and sell them. And so I have a deal worked out with one of my friends where I send them leads for their coaching funnel and they pay me a commission if they close them over the phone. And that's like a $6,000 coaching program. Nice. So I'm actually working on getting that dialed in right now. Nice. Um, so I, I guess uh, one of the things I really want to point out though is like you're not really doing anything that's like super out there, super in depth that like your average person couldn't do. You're doing all the basics and kind of like advanced basics and you're doing them really damn well. It's so like you have one offer that's working on cold traffic that's scaling on YouTube and you have some autoresponders and you have a little bit of a back end right now. Like you really honestly don't need any more than that to get going. Uh, I, I really want to make that point because so many people focus on, they, they try to make three or four different offers work at once, uh, or they try right. to make three or four traffic sources work at once. You can kind of see what actually works here by seeing what Connor does. Uh, he focused on one traffic source, YouTube, one offer. And until that worked, he really didn't focus on anything else. Um, and that, that's always my suggestion to a lot of people when you're trying to get an offer going, it's one offer, one traffic source. And once you have that dialed in, it's kicking ass. Like Connor's doing 100 sales a day now. He could start to branch out. Okay, let's see if I can make this work on Facebook or Native or wherever else I want to run it. Um, but until you get to that point, don't be trying to do multiple things at once. The, like, the, success, the success, uh, success usually comes from the simplicity. 
Um, and if you're able to really simplify things, that's, that's when the winners happen. Yeah, that's something that I got from the first live event in Austin last year. I think the guys from VShred were talking about this, the, the phrase you just used, basics and advanced basics. If you just stay focused on that. And like once I got my offer working, I started testing new leads on it or testing new upsells and just whatever's working, I'm trying to make it work better. Yep. Yeah, I mean, the reality is like what Stefan and I teach in the mastermind, it's like we teach ads, we teach leads, uh, we teach mechanism and we teach upsells. It's like if you can hit those four things, your offer is going to work. Um, hell, you can, you can hit like three out of the four and it'll work. Um, but it really boils down to those. I mean, you, you don't need all these other ninja tricks and stuff that people end up usually wasting too much time on. It's, it's actually pretty basic what, what it takes to work. Um, all right. So let, let's dive into one question I actually want to ask you about. So you joined our mastermind when you weren't like a millionaire by any means. You weren't crushing it. Uh, it was a big, I know it was a big financial leap for you to join the mastermind. Um, and I, I know you said even, I think it was like five or six months into it, you were like wondering if this was going to pay off because you hadn't gotten your offer working yet. Let's talk a little about that and kind of the, the leap and the faith you had to, to make that jump and kind of how it felt along the way. Yeah, I was definitely nervous to jump into that. Um, I, I was pretty sure I wanted to join the mastermind before attending the live event back in September. And then that just kind of sealed the deal. Once I was there, I realized like, I need to be in this group. I need to commit to this fully. And I had a couple other like contracting gigs where I was working for this other company or, you know, just running my own email list, just making a living off of it. And I decided this is what I want to do. The upside is so big. Like I can make millions of dollars from this. So I need to commit fully just to this and find a way to make it work. So I actually quit a job that was paying me like four or five grand a month. And I told him, hey, I got to go work on my own thing. It's really important to me. Um, that was scary just to give up like certain money. But to free up my time, it was worth it. And uh, see, I was moving time and ended up selling my car. I ended up uh, moving to Asia. I could live for a lot cheaper for a while. I was living in Boston and I moved to Colombia. So I just started doing the, you have a lot of freedom when you do this kind of work to be a nomad if you want. I mean, not right now because of COVID, but before that, you know, uh, for a thousand bucks a month, you can live like a king in some countries. And a lot of people in our line of work choose to do that for a while and just kind of leverage. I'm making money. I'm making American dollars, but I can live somewhere else and my money will go a lot farther. Yeah. And that helped me stretch the money that I had just to give me some time to get this offer together and get it working. And also, I wanted to be able to at least save a little bit so that I could put it into cold traffic. Smart, man. Really smart. So I just kind of rearranged everything to try and afford it until it paid off. Yep. And was it, was that correct? It took you probably about six months or so. Uh, yeah. Somewhere yeah. And I, I still had to do a bunch of other stuff just to keep money rolling in, in the meantime, otherwise I could have done it a lot sooner. Yep. Um, and now that it's interesting too, that was the first one I put out on cold traffic and I had built all the systems around it. Whereas I just launched another one and it took me three weeks to put together. <laughs> so you get momentum after you do one it, it, and, and the confidence too. I, I had a lot more confidence after it started to work. Yeah, definitely. It's interesting that transition from freelancer to offer owner, because you do kind of have to balance two things at once. Uh, Cause you have to keep money coming in so you can pay your bills and your lifestyle, whatever you have. Uh, but on the other hand, it's like, okay, I, I can't be working 60 hours a week writing copy for clients and then trying to do my offer with whatever little spare time I have left. Um, it yeah. is an interesting balance and it's, it's smart how you, you, you made that huge decision to forego the, the $4,000 a month that that client was paying you, which I've done that before too. And it's scary as shit. Uh, <laughs> because you're like, yeah. you, you never know what's going to happen. Like shit could hit the fan. I mean, hell coronavirus could hit and the whole world could fall apart and, my income could be gone. This $4,000 would be nice. Um, but I think if you're in the spot where you, you were at a great spot in the sense that you truly knew what worked in the niche, uh, you knew how to create your own offer. You just really had to have the balls to go after it and do it and, and just fully commit to it. Um, 
And I mean, that's obviously paying off for you now. Yeah. And you know, there's, there's a certain amount of confidence and excitement you get when you make a commitment like that 100%. Like this is definitely happening. I'm, once my offer started working, I wasn't surprised. I knew it was going to work. It was just a matter of time because awesome. I made that commitment up front. Awesome. So one last question I have for you. Um, what's the next, let's say, six to 12 to 18 months look like for your business? What, what are your kind of plans for growing it, scaling it, uh, back end, new offers? What, what are you looking at right now? That's a good question. Um, well, I just launched a second offer, so I want to see if I can scale that one too and have two offers working on cold traffic. Um, I'm also upgrading all the systems that I built. So when I first got the offer off the ground, everything's very basic and rudimentary. I don't even have a members area. There's no passwords. A after you buy the product, you get a link to a page and you just download it. And honestly, anyone could steal that if they had the link, you know? Yep. Um, but it was easier than hiring the customer service and figuring out a membership site. So I just went with the fast route. So now that it's all working, um, I'm going to upgrade all of that stuff, build a real bona fide members area. I need to upgrade all of my tech, my tracking. I don't have good enough tracking set up. So a lot of my campaigns aren't tracking sales as accurately as they could be. And that's probably losing me a lot of money. So just upgrading all of the tech stuff that I couldn't afford to do before. Uh, but now I can pay people to do that, you know? Yep. Um, I also want to build out like an actual brand. So right now I'm the expert for my product and I don't want to be long-term. I'd like to build out a brand that's more about the name of a company than the name of a person. And potentially, you know, 18 months from now, if I could have a brand with multiple experts underneath it and all the systems in place, I would like to be able to have this business run all on its own without me there. And potentially um, I could sell it as an asset if I wanted to. So really systemizing myself out of the business. That's what I'm working on now. Nice. Good goal, man. Um, Thanks. All right. So last, last question I actually want to ask you before we wrap up. Let's say somebody's watching this. Uh, they've thought of joining Copy Accelerator or maybe even Copy Accelerator Lite at some point. Uh, what would be your kind of words of advice or feedback to them? Well, it probably depends on what, they, what their goal is. Um, but I guess since we're talking about going from being a copywriter to an offer owner, if that's your goal, um, carve out the time to make your own offer now. I mean, that's what the RMBC method is about, is writing a, a sales piece that can work on cold traffic. If you've never done that before, there's stuff you've got to learn, like how to build the funnel, how to set up all the systems, you know, that could take some time. So start finding out ways to do that now. Um, a lot of people too have asked, well, how did I get to where I am? I mean, I, I definitely recommend working for somebody else that's already got it figured out. Um, that's probably the smartest thing I did in order to get here is working for other companies. They were already making millions of dollars and I got in to write their emails. So I was able to see data and learn what the market was about and specialize. I don't, I've never really written much copy outside of dating. I just really focused on that. Um, but yeah, focus on one niche, work for somebody else who's already successful that can pay you while you learn. And uh, if you want to have your own offer, start building it out now because it might take some time to figure out all the pieces. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point. Um, it, one of the things I recommend to like new people all the time, if they don't really have the chop shed, I'm like, go work for someone who's doing what you want to do and just learn from them for a year, learn from them for two years, whatever it is. Uh, because there's nothing more, even if you get paid dog shit, even if you don't get paid at all, like there's nothing more valuable than exactly what you did and coming out of that, knowing exactly what works, what hooks, what angles, what copy, that that's how you become successful. Um, and it's, it's, it's a highly valuable thing that you did. Yeah. There's a lot of, um, there's like a belief among a lot of entrepreneurs that I think just gets spread by famous people or Instagrammers or people want to do this kind of work because they don't want to have a job. They don't want to work for somebody else. But if you don't already know how to do that, then probably the best thing you could do is have a job working for somebody else. Like it's not a bad thing to have a job. Yep. Yep. I agree. I very much agree. Cool, man. This was, uh, this was awesome. I truly appreciate you coming on sharing your story. I think a lot of the freelancers listening to this will probably get a ton out of it. Uh, maybe it'll push Thanks. a few of them over the edge to get away from working with clients and to put their own offer out there and uh, make a bunch more money. So definitely appreciate you sharing everything. Thanks again, man. 
It was my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me.